morning, welcome. Good to see you all. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank you. They're in the right spot there. I want to thank the stores for opening up their home yesterday. We had this great time. Amen. chapter 7 verse 14 the scripture says if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked, wicked ways then I will hear from heaven I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land today is uh, first and foremost the Lord's day but in our culture it's also a unique day when we honor our fallen soldiers. Jesus said in John 15, 13, that no, no greater love has any man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. And we want to uh, give a moment, pause in prayer, and thank the Lord for, first of all, the privilege of uh, his sovereign choice to be able to place us in a land that is free, been paid for and bought and paid for with the blood of many that have gone before us and given their lives and sacrificed to that cause. And to quote uh, the famous poet Charlie Daniels, <laughs> this lady may have stumbled, yet she ain't never fell. And we're so grateful. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful today that you have set the boundaries of our habitation. You have allowed us to live free. What a blessing that is. And we do want to honor those who have gone before and paid the ultimate price to give us that freedom. We pray, Lord, that you do uh, hear from your people who are humbling themselves and praying, praying for our government, praying for our leaders, that we would repent and turn. Turn to you, Father. That's the only way our land's going to be healed. We pray for revival in our country. We pray that your mighty hand would be seen, and we want to thank you and praise you for all that you do for us, in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Nope, stay standing, sorry. <coughs> Let's start our song service out this morning on 799, hymn 799, American Review. <laughs>
invite you to turn your Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Because it is a unique day, and, and often on Memorial Day, lots of folks are traveling, going to church with family in other places, some even go fishing. Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. 
Pentecost was 50 days after um, after the Feast of First Fruits, which was the day that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. So exactly 50 days after that day, after the resurrection, this day occurs. You've heard me say many times, and I just repeated it in our prayer, that our rule, our authority, for everything that we do here, we call it our rule of faith and practice, is this book. Is this book. It's not me, it's not the deacons. Um, everything, it rules. They use today's vernacular, the Bible rules. The review for most of you, Sunday school, and when you were kids, the Bible has 66 books. 39 in the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, 27 in the New Covenant or the New Testament. And those words are interchangeable in Scripture. Testament is covenant, covenant is a testament. In the Old Covenant, God chose a vehicle to be the representative of his message. That message, or that vehicle, was the nation of Israel. It's a physical nation. Turn with me, hold your place in Acts. Turn. We're going to be doing a little bit around this one, not so much. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. couple verses here. Beginning in verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. Talking about Israel. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all the people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, because he would keep an oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of the bondman, or from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. And repayeth them that hate him to their face, and destroys them. He will not be slack to them that hates him. He will repay him to his face. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments, and the statutes, and the judgments, which I command thee this day to do them. And he's about to uh, repeat all the commandments that he gave them back in Exodus. And we know that. In, in summary form as the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments, that's the Old Covenant. The Law. By the way, the Law, the Ten Commandments, were given to one people, the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel. Um, they're all good commands, and, and it's fine if you know them and keep them. They are all... Uh, Good to do, except for one, the fourth one. Uh, we're under no obligation, because we're not Jewish, to keep the Sabbath. You can do it if you want to. Nothing wrong with it. It goes from 6 o'clock Friday afternoon to 6 o'clock Saturday afternoon. And it just means that you're not going to do any work. You're going to spend all day thinking about and honoring the Lord. Um, but it was given to the Jews. And there's lots of laws. Actually, there's 613 laws in all. It's all the mitzvah. Not just those ten. The ten were written in stone. There's 613 altogether. And the way we know, lots of ways we know that it was only given to the Jews and not to anybody else is, um, you know, I've been a Christian for a few years and I've never been to Israel. And every faithful Jew under the law has to go to Jerusalem three times a year. It's required to. If you're a devout Jew under the law, you're required to go to Jerusalem. Times a year. You're required to 
do sacrifice um, by a lamb and sacrifice a lamb on uh, Passover and do that with your family. It's called, uh, I can't remember the Jewish name for that. Do you remember all the hands? Passover. Anyway, um, so there's all kinds of laws that they had that I've never done. I'm required to do it because I'm not Jewish. That's the old covenant. It was replaced by the new covenant. Now, it's foundational. Everything that God did through the nation of Israel brought us the salvation that we know. John 4.22, salvation is of the Jews. We wouldn't have salvation if God didn't use the Jewish nation to bring us Jesus. Genesis 12.23, God told Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed through you, through the nation of Israel. So, um, but they, uh, and, and the similar command that God had for Israel in the Old Testament, you can find this in Isaiah 16. 1, 6 and Exodus 19 6 he says that you are designed to be a peculiar people a chosen generation a royal priesthood and their job was to be a light to the world a light unto the Gentiles and uh, we know that they failed in that mission similarly though God gave us the same message the church has the same message in 1 Peter 2 9 we are peculiar people we're a uh, a, a royal priesthood and we are to take the witness of Christ to the world just like the vehicle that God used in the Old Testament the Old Covenant what changed? well I'll turn quickly to Matthew chapter 23 Matthew chapter 23 did they get fired? did they get thrown in the garbage can? what, what happened to the nation of Israel? The answer, of course, is no. But they did get set aside. Matthew chapter 23, and I'm going to start in verse 34. Verse 34. Wherefore, this is Jesus speaking here, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you kill and crucify, some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, the son of Bacchaeus, whom he slew between the temple and the altar. Wherefore I say, that verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that were sent unto thee, how often I would have gathered you, gathered thy children together, even as the hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, until you should say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And then starting from chapter 24, just two verses. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said unto him, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So, Christ presented himself as the Messiah, and the nation of Israel rejected him as the Messiah. Instead, they crucified him. Of course, that was God's plan all along. God used the evil of men to bless the world. He gave us a Savior. But he did judge the nation of Israel. He set them aside. The way we know that today, as Jesus said right here, that, you know, the disciples are all um, uh, proud of their beautiful temple that they have. And they're, they're showing Jesus. And they're like, you know, you just said all these things, and, you know, look at this grand, beautiful temple here. And Jesus said, not very long from now, that temple is not, is not only going to be destroyed, it's not even going to have one brick upon another. It's not going to have two layers of bricks. And we know that that actually came to pass uh, literally in 70 AD when Titus came and destroyed Jerusalem, they, they inadvertently set fire to the temple. And when they did, the 
the gold inlay that they had in the temple melted and went in between the cracks of the rocks. So in order to be able to retrieve the gold in the temple, they had to dismantle every row of stone all the way down to the base. So what you see today, and it's still this way today, you have the temple mount, which is the, the huge foundation of where the temple once was, but there's no temple there at all. As a matter of fact, they debate as to actually where on this temple mount the temple actually was located. And they're, they're, they, they, they want to try to nail that down because very soon they're going to have another temple. We're going to talk about that in a minute. God's not done with the nation of Israel. Amen? Amen. He made a promise to them, and he's going to bring them back. When the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled, he is going to go back and deal with the nation of Israel again, and they will once again be his vehicle for spreading the gospel on the earth. But God took the, the job from the nation of Israel... And he said, in the Old Testament, he said, you know, he knew this day was going to come. He said through the prophet Jeremiah, through the prophet Ezekiel, Isaiah, several others, one day you're going to be scattered. You're going to be scattered. We call it diaspora. And you're going to be scattered all throughout the earth. And then a long time is going to go by, then I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to bring you back in unbelief. Then I'm going to put my spirit within you, and then you're going to be uh, my people again. Uh, if you read Ezekiel 36 and 37, it actually tells you that story uh, verbatim that I just told you. And then again, we know historically that's exactly what happened. When Titus came in, if you were a Jew and you didn't leave Israel, you're killed. But a lot did. A lot got out. And then throughout the centuries, you know, there were, there were Jews that lived in Russia, there were Jews that lived in Europe, a lot of Jews made it their way to the United States, there's a lot, of, uh, there's a large Jewish population in the United States today. They're all over the world. But then following World War II, um, they were granted the charter to become a nation again. They got their land back. They came back rose the Star of David for the first time in almost 2,000 years. Israel became a nation once again. So just like the Bible says, they have been gathered back in unbelief. They're not a spiritual nation today. They're mostly secular. But at least God has them back in the place where Bible prophecy takes up. We'll talk about that another day. But when Bible prophecy takes up, it assumes Israel's already back in the land. And they're coming back in droves. They have been for, you know, 75 years now. They're, they're 16 million strong back in Israel today. And God has them right where they're ready for the next step, the next chapter in what he's doing with the world. There's one more little period of time. He's going to deal with the nation of Israel. The Bible refers to it in Jeremiah as the time of Jacob's trouble, in uh, Matthew 24 as the tribulation period, and in, in Revelation, a time that has never been seen before, uh, Daniel 12, uh, a time of calamity, many, many places in Scripture. There's a seven-year period of time when God is going to use the nation of Israel in a very, very dramatic way. And I have some ideas about how that's playing out, even as we see in geopolitical politics right now, it's all coming together. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I want to take just a moment and, and refer you to, if you're a follower of Breitbart, go back and look for some articles that was posted over the last couple of days. The uh, United Nations Human Rights Council just voted this week to issue a permanent um, board that will oversee disciplinary measures on the nation of Israel's human rights violations. Permanent board that is going to be investigating and getting to the bottom of all their human rights atrocities. 
By the way, four nations on the United Nations Human Rights Council are Russia, China, Venezuela, uh, who is the other? They're all four rogue dictatorships that all are terrible human rights violators. By the way, Russia, China, and one other one have what they call veto power. They can never be investigated themselves because they can always veto it. By the way, no, I don't want to go there. Anyway, so that's 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 the steps that you see. The whole world is beginning to turn against Israel, and that's God's plan. The whole world is going to be against Israel. All right, let's move on. So God created another institution called the church. Matthew 16, 16, you'll remember that um, Peter's confession. Uh, Who do men say that I am, Jesus said. And Peter spoke for the group. He stood up and said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And, uh, and Jesus' response was, uh, Thou hast said well. And, and, and my Father gave that to your heart to say, And upon this rock I will build my church the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now what he meant there was that statement that he had just made. Uh, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the rock that our institution, our organization, if you will, is built upon. The church is built upon the profession that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. Amen? Amen. So that, is, that is the cornerstone of who we are and what we believe. So, there, Jesus predicted it. I will build future tents. I will build my church. If you look in the parables of Matthew 13, a couple of them there talk about the church. One of them is uh, the parable of the mustard tree. How it starts out from a seed, and it starts to plant, and it gets branches, then it eventually gets birds. And what that means is that the church started out very small. One, it started out with 12 people, and it went to 120 people. And in our text, it went to 3,000 people. A few pages later in Acts, there's another 4,000 added, then another 5,000. Uh, then within a year, there was more Gentiles in the church than there were Jews. So it started spreading all over. And then the birds at the end, that's, that's Satan coming and attacking, bringing evil into the church. The church is under attack. Amen? The church is under attack. All worldwide. Anywhere there's Christians living, Chinese Christians are being uh, attacked, uh, African uh, churches are being attacked, um, American churches are being attacked. So all over, Satan, Satan is attacking the church. But, we just read, gates of hell will not prevail against it. There will be faith on the earth when Jesus comes. We were promised that. All right, so um, most of the New Testament is written to churches. Written to churches, about churches, how to do church, what to do, what not to do. We have the Corinthians, the Galatians, the Colossians, the Philippians, the Ephesians, the Church of Sardis, the Church of Thyatira, the Church of the Thessalonians. I mean, there's, there's at least 40 churches named in the New Testament. <coughs> Now, what we read in our text is the first one. The First Baptist Church of Jerusalem was the first church ever to be in existence. Where we read Acts chapter 2. But then that day, they spread out. God designed it so that they were all there for the Feast of Pentecost. And then after the feast, they all went back to their homes, wherever they were from. And they took the gospel with them on Roman roads that Caesar built. They traveled and took the gospel to the world. So churches popped up all over the place very quickly. Next one, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. in that process, and this is how it still works today. 
The word, the authority, is proclaimed, it's preached, it's taught. The people hear it, they're pricked in their hearts. God calls them by faith. They respond to the message by faith. They repent of their sins. They turn from their self and selfishness and worldliness and sin, and they turn to Christ, believing that foundational um, uh, uh, profession, Jesus Christ, is the Son of the Living God. And that, that, that of course, includes everything. And he went through it in his, in his uh, sermon that he died on the cross, he was raised the third day for our sin. That's all in that, in that message that he preached. So we see word preached, the response of the people to repent and turn in faith, and then commanded is to be baptized. Now we've been talking a lot in Romans how when we repent and turn to Christ, that is the baptism. By faith we're united with Christ in faith. We, we were made to die with him, be buried with him, and raise again in newness of life. When we trust Christ for our salvation, he makes us a new creature. He gives us a new heart. He makes us um, be repulsed by our life of sin, our former life, and want to live a life for God, to honor Him and to please Him. That's the conversion. He not only declares us righteous, but He makes us love righteousness and want to be holy and righteous. Then, we're baptized. That pictures what happened in our salvation. It pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it is visible. We all see it when it happens, right? Then when we see that, that adds you to the visible number. Now you're already added to the church, invisible, and you may hear this a lot. I, I hear it too much. You hear, you hear the term the body of Christ, the universal church, there is a lot of talk about the universal church and the body of Christ. And it's a real thing. Don't get me wrong. The Bible uses the term church, ecclesia, the called out ones. That's the church. It's the people, by the way. It's not this building. It's the people that are called out to salvation who believe and trust Jesus Christ. That's the church. Church, word church is used 150 times in the New Testament. Out of that 115 times, and we actually did this before, there's about 10 times that the reference is in Scripture to the universal church, to the whole, complete body of Christ of believers everywhere of all time, from the day of Pentecost till today. 10 times. Every other time, the other 105 times, it's always a reference to the visible, local New Testament church. Always. The Philippians, the Galatians, the Colossians, the, the Church of Thyatira, the Church of Sardis, the Church of Smyrna. And what those churches were to do in that visible way. Ephesians 2, if you're there, we're going to start reading in verse um, 19. Now therefore you are no more citizens, strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord in whom also ye are builded together for an inhabitation of God through the Spirit. Now, what's he saying there? First of all, he's writing to the Ephesians, and it's the church of Ephesus, and he's writing to the people in Ephesus, and he's explaining to them, look, Israel was a physical people of God who had physical laws written in stone and had physical ceremonies, and a physical temple that they went to three times a year, you're not. You're not a physical nation that has a name 
Israel. You're a spiritual nation. You're a spiritual nation of called out citizens of, not of anywhere on earth, your citizenship is in heaven, Philippians 2 tells us. And your temple is the gathered saints of all time in the church. That is making the building. And it's growing. It's growing like that tree I was telling you about in Matthew 13. That temple is growing and growing and growing. Getting bigger and bigger. Every time somebody gets saved, the temple gets a little bit bigger. But notice some, some things about this building, this temple. Its foundation, stone, the chief cornerstone, that's where the buildings, ancient buildings always began from, is Christ himself. He is the chief cornerstone. He is the, the founding principle of our faith. He is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. He is the one who bought and paid for our salvation. He purchased the church with his own blood. Ephesians, uh, no, Acts 20 tells us that. And then the foundation of the temple is the apostles and prophets. Everybody see that there? The apostles and prophets. I don't want to take a lot of time to tell you this, but those were two founding offices in the church. They were necessary. Same way they were necessary in the old covenant. God called Isaiah as a prophet to come and foretell his word and to preserve it, write it down. Well, he did the same thing in the New Covenant. He used the apostles and prophets to do miracles, spread the word, and write the scripture. It had to have a foundation. We had to have laws. We had to have our part of knowing how to live out this thing called Christianity. Those offices ceased. The offices of prophet and apostle. Which ones stay? What offices does the church have today? Only has two. Today the church has the office of bishop and deacon. Bishop and deacon. Now, bishop has three words in scripture that it uses to describe the same office. It's just not a hierarchy of offices. Bishop, elder, and pastor. Three different words in the Greek. Uh, episkopos is um, bishop. Uh, 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 pastuo appointment, I'm sorry, is pastor, that's shepherd, one who feeds and takes care of his flock. And the elder, that word is uh, presbyteros, and it means somebody who is mature in the faith. Now it's, it's funny, you just kind of heard two denominations, episkopos and presbyteros. Uh, and, it, and it's funny how they actually do their hierarchy in the church. They have levels of importance in their church, starting off with lay elders, and then they have pastors, and then they have, a, until you get all the way up to the bishop, who's like the, the, the top. No, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says all these offices are just three ways to describe the one guy that's called said that wrong. Not one guy. Every local New Testament church was supposed to have a plurality of these guys. We have two here. Um, John is actually ordained, but he's not serving right now, so we had three. But hopefully he'll be back serving soon. We want to have a plurality. We want to have as many elders as possible in our church. That's the guy that God has called personally guys to feed and protect. Feed and protect. And again, what are we feeding and protecting? We're feeding the rule of faith and practice. Everything comes from here. It's not my opinion, it's not Kevin's opinion. We get it from Scripture. Amen? Amen. And then the other office is deacon, the servant. Now these offices intertwine and they're connected. A deacon can teach. Um, a Sunday school class or whatever. As a matter of fact, part of the deacon's qualifications in Timothy 3 is that he needs to have a firm grasp on the mysteries of the faith and, and be able to teach it and, 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 and 
Explain it. So pastors and deacons, pastors and deacons. And a pastor can take food to a widow. That, that can, we, we do that too. So we cross over a lot. There's two ordinances that Jesus gave us, two ordinances that the church does. We don't go to Jerusalem three times a year. We don't sacrifice lambs. We do baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. And these actually define who the body of Christ local is. Let me explain. When you got saved, nobody saw that. It's a spiritual transaction. It's between you and Jesus Christ and God. So there's not a bell that goes off. There's not a lightning bolt that happens. It's just you receiving Christ as your Savior and you being transformed from a, a dead sinner into a living uh, uh, soul that's living eternal life of Christ. So that's a, that's a spiritual transaction that you can't see. That baptism into the Holy Spirit, into Christ by the Holy Spirit, is a spiritual thing. This is something that pictures that, but that we can see. We all agree on that, right? So when we see this, that's your public, visible profession. And that's what adds you to the visible, public gathering. That's how you got, and you all should know this, that's how you got on the membership roll of this church or any church. That's how you should have. That's how you're added to the roster. The Lord's Supper, you can go read 1 Corinthians 5, the Lord's Supper, besides being a memorial of the Lord and communion with Him and with each other, it is also the boundary of the gathering. So this is how you got into the visible church. The Lord's Supper is how you maintain your status as a viable member of the Lord's church. First Corinthians 5 talks about a, a member. Paul is writing the church, another visible local church, Corinth, and he's telling the Corinthian congregation, hey look, I've heard all the way over here in Ephesus that you've got a guy in your church that's having an affair with his stepmother. That's no bueno, no good. You need to go and address that issue. That is something that even even lost people frown upon, let alone having that going on right in the, the church of the living God. So he, he's telling them, look, we have a responsibility. Now everybody's going to sin. And, and for one sin, you know, we're not going to be on each other like that. But if there's a pattern of, you know, if you're out robbing banks, hey, we need to kind of have a talk. Right? That's what we do as Christians. We are our brother's keeper. We do come alongside and gently nudge you to get back into the fold. Get things right with God. If you're a professed believer, we have a responsibility to maintain iron sharpening iron, watching out for one another. 1 Timothy 3, 15 and 16 says that the church is the pillar and ground of truth. It is the vehicle. It is the repository of the gospel message. It is the way God works to bring a dark and dying world into his kingdom. It's our job. It's our one mission being here is to be a light to the lost. The visible church is to gather on a regular basis. Hebrews 10.25 says, Let us hold fast our profession of faith without wavering, for he that is faithful to call the promise. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. So just like I have conversations with people that you know, sometimes it's just ignorance. Some people just don't know. So when I talk to somebody that claims to be a Christian, I'll say, you know, uh, how old were you when you were baptized? Well, I haven't been baptized. Red flag. The Bible says the first act of obedience. I don't say it that way, of course. I'm like, well, why, why haven't you been baptized? 
Or I, I was, you know, I was christened as a baby. Well, the Bible's clear. That's not baptism. The, the order is always given very clearly. The Ethiopian eunuch in, in Acts chapter 10, he heard the word, he received the word, and then he was baptized by Philip. The, the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16, he came in and asked Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. And then they took him and baptized him. Uh, Lydia, the seller of purple, from Thyatira, down by the river, she came to the church meeting, she heard the message, God opened her heart to believe, and then she was baptized. Baptism is always an act of obedience following the profession of faith to be saved. Amen? So if you got water sprinkled on your forehead when you were, you know, two weeks old, that's nice. You had a little family gathering. It's not a baptism. You did not profess faith. You cannot be saved by your parents' faith. That's not how you get into the church of Jesus Christ. So we'll have a nice talk, hopefully, and we'll come around to the understanding that the Bible gives that baptism follows conversion. The vehicle that we are told to live out our Christian faith in is the local New Testament church. There's all these commands in the New Testament that say things like this. Romans 12, 10. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints given to hospitality. He's writing to the Roman church, and he's telling them to do this one to another. That's how you live out your Christianity. One to another. Another one. Next chapter, Romans 13, 8. Owe no man anything but love one another, for he that loves another has to build the law. We shouldn't have obligations and debts to each other. We should be free to love and serve Romans 15, 5. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that he may be of one mind and one mouth, glorifying God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we should have unity. We should all be thinking alike because we should all have biblically filtered minds. Amen? There is over 50 of these in the New Testament. 50 of these. One another commands of how the church is supposed to pray for one another, serve one another, be submitted to one another, kindly affectionate to one another. I mean, on and on and on. I mean, I can go on 50. Good to you now. <laughs> and then what's the point of this? Jesus said, John 13, 35, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you what? Love one another. So as we go through this life of churchness, living out our church, serving one another, praying for one another, this is how the world gets the testimony of who we are. Who we are. We're his people. We're his nation. We're his church. So how do you become a church member? How do you become a church member? What if, what if you weren't baptized here? <coughs> what if you were baptized in another church somewhere else with another name? If you were ba baptized in, a, in a, a, a church of Christ or a, you know, a Bible church or any other kind of church that, that practices believer's baptism, well, you basically just submit yourself as a candidate for membership. You can, you can come forward at an invitation you can call me on the phone during the week and say, Brother Ken, how do I become a member? And I'll ask you these questions. Tell me about your conversion and tell me about your baptism. And if either one of those, if you have questions about either one of those, we'll talk it through. We'll figure out, has there been a conversion and has there been a scriptural baptism? And if either one need attention, we'll, we'll, we'll give you some attention. Now, if you're already convinced, like a lot of Christians are, I know I'm a believer, and I know I've been scripturally baptized. Then basically, you're just saying, I want to be a member. That's it. 
And then you're, you're giving testimony to the fact that those things have occurred. So you know you're converted and you know you've been spiritually baptized. Now, the reason why I say this is from time to time we have visitors. We love visitors. That's how people actually become members over time. That's how all of us became members of this church. At one time you visited somehow or some way. Either you were brought by a friend or you just, you know, you liked the, the, the color of the church or whatever. Something brought you here. One day you had nothing better to do um, and you got here. So, I know and I realize there's a lot of people in transition. We live in a fluid world of flux, things are always changing. Maybe, maybe you're, you just moved here recently. You've only lived here for a few months and you, you, know, you visited here a few times, you, you like it. You know, you're, you're fed the word when you come here and that's the most important thing. If you're considering being a member of this church or any church, Understand a couple things. Number one, all churches that have humans in them, all are flawed. They all have problems and they all have issues because we're people. Um, so even if you join this church, you're going to find out that we're not perfect people. Um, so that's number one. Um, I forgot the other one. <laughs> anyway, so if you're, if you're looking for a church, you need to look for a church. That's the other one, the most important one. You need to look for a church that's Bible that, that what is glorified and honored in our midst is not me, it's not the singers. Those things are fine because they're part of our church. But what is honored here and set forth above all else is the Word of God. Amen? Amen. So that's, that's the number one thing. Then you, you go on our website and you read through our statement of faith, making sure that lines up with Scripture. Making sure that everything that we say we believe lines up with something in the Bible. Saying that that's what it should be. So I say that with the intent that, uh, again, some people may just not know. And for uh, for any believer to be obedient to God, to be obedient to the Bible, you need to be a part of a local New Testament church. You need to be a visible, voluntary, accountable member of a church local body. Amen. So, I want to, maybe you don't know, maybe you don't know if you are a member or not, because a lot, of, a lot of churches don't have official church membership. A lot of people just, a lot of churches don't want to deal with it, or they're too big, they have to keep up with it, so they, they just say, well, you know, people come, they're fine, it's good. Here's the problem with that, all those 50 one another commands, how do I know who the one another's are, if I don't even know your name? I don't even know, you know, I've seen you once or twice, I have no idea who you are. Things like we did yesterday, that's a one another idea. Where you get to know people, you sit down, maybe you're talking to somebody you haven't really gotten to know before, you get to know them. Church needs to be a family. we got to know each other. In order to be able to live out those one another commands, i got to see you more than just on the bench on Sunday morning. we gotta, we got we to gotta be hanging out sometimes. <laughs> Here's the church membership list I have. I just updated this. So this message gave me an excuse to get this done. I haven't done it in a while. So I want to read it. There's only like 40 names here. Real quick, if you don't hear your name and you know you're a member of this church, please come see me so I can get this fixed. Um, but if you don't hear your name and you know you're not a member of this church, I would like you to consider and ask some questions as to, you know, here's, here's what we need to do next. All right. Dottie All Britton, Michael Barton, Janelle Bauer, Bill Binkley, Kathy Binkley, William Baeza, Trish Baeza, Debbie Carr, Kevin Carr, Wesley Carr, Jimmy Carter, Karen Carter, Jody Duncan, Pete Gonzalez, Danny Hatmaker, Mary Hatmaker, Cody Hatmaker, Hunter Hatmaker, Mary Marie Hood, Fred Jones, Betty Jones, Beth Kissinger, Gary Kissinger Sr., Zach Kissinger, Herbetta Kissinger, Herbie, Gary Jr. Kissinger, Chrissy Mann, Ken Mann, Robert Mather, Sherry Mather, Barbara Moody, David Moody, Al Pierce, Janelle Plowman, Luis, Luisa Ponte, Jennifer Rogers, Aaron Rogers, Beverly Russell, Janet Sawyer, Johnny Shores, Jody Shores, Diana Story, John Tucker, Pam Tucker, Mark Tucker, Jennifer Walters, Tommy Walters, Thomas Walters, Brooke Walters, Joe Wilson, and Debbie Wilson. 
So that's all I have. Please help me update my records, make sure this is right. And then we proudly post this. We want people to know that we're a family. We know each other's name, we know where you live, we know who your kids are, we know what's ticking in your life. So we can be there. We can be there to serve, we can be there to pray. That's what a church is. And then we can be a light to the world that needs us, needs the gospel. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the opportunity to uh, have visitors come and be with us in, in any time. Somebody wants to come and just be here, that's fine. We love having people here and, and being with us and getting to know them. But uh, Father, we thank you for the privilege of being a visible, um, willing member and participant of the visible local New Testament church. And, and knowing that that's how you have decided that your word is going to be um, uh, passed down and passed along, and how you're going to be honored here on this earth. And we know the time is short. We know that you're about to take up your plan and program with Israel again soon, and that you're going to be rapturing your church out for the official first-time gathering of the universal, visible church. And we so look forward to that moment in time. But for now, Father, we're being trying to be obedient and live out church the way you described. We pray that you help us to honor you in that. In Christ's name, amen. amen. If you have a need to respond today, we invite you to come. Let's <coughs> stand together and sing. 491, 491. Celebrate and, and commemorate the uh, month of 
that died for us to, to be a free country, Lord. And so, we ask your blessings upon this nation and each and every one of us that they may become a million one day. And I know that in Jesus' name I pray to you.